Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, I'm out of the office this week, so there will not be any live streams, but I did want to make sure I have at least a few videos for you guys. These are going to be a little bit more simple and things. Um, I had a request to talk a little bit about security cameras, IP cameras, and things like that. Now, I'm not doing a full-blown tutorial here. I'm just kind of giving you some basic concepts, some things to think about. And if we do need to do a long, comprehensive tutorial later, we can possibly do that. I just kind of wrote out a few tips about cameras, do's and don'ts, and things like this. Now, for me personally, your first thing, I would completely avoid any of your big name cameras. You know, you got your Ring doorbells, you got your Nest cameras, which are Google products. Any of these big products or any of these modern things that are just selling you these apps, because all of these things that have these easy company apps to sync into your cameras, all of that data feed it's getting is being sent up and stored on somebody else's servers, or at least has the potential to be stored on somebody else's servers. And that's not something that we want. Um, I actually use cameras that probably aren't the most um, uh, reputation, but I've never had any issues and I've never noticed any weird network stuff. Um, I actually picked mine up from x10.com and they are AirSight, which are just some generic Chinese cameras, uh, but they don't really have any other backgrounds. Now, I don't connect them to the internet, um, I connect them to an internal LAN, and that's about it. They do have DNS settings, and if I were to purchase a plan, it, I could use those. I don't do any of those. Like I said, the way I use them, plug them in and turn them on, I have never seen any weird network chatter on them. Uh, so just, just be aware of that. Um, but I am picking up my cameras at x10.com because they sell cameras that don't have all these back-end apps. They're not these big name brand companies. And I have found that they have worked well for me. And I have three of them here. I did have five, you know, like I said, a lot of them were outside and I've had them for over a decade. So, you know, the fact that I still have three out of my original five, 10 years later is actually not too bad. Um, but ultimately I wanna make sure that I'm not using any cameras that are automatically set up for simplicity because the simpler it is, it means that more companies are getting their fingers in your data and sending stuff potentially to their cloud. And that means tracking you and things like that. That's the type of stuff that I personally want to avoid. It does give me some issues and challenges. Um, there are a few uh, open source camera apps that if I wanted to, I could compile them, but there's nothing on F-Droid I can get which means I can't necessarily look at my camera feeds on my phone unless I were to do something like, um, you know, I could compile the app or there might be some other ways I can grab some apps available on the Google Play services store uh, without actually installing Google Play. Uh, we'll see. I've never actually had that emergency. What I do with my cameras is mine are set up that uh, they're motion censored. If there's motion, they send me an email uh, picture sequence. So every time there's a trigger, I get six simultaneous images from the camera feed. So I don't really have a need to be always checking in and monitoring my cameras to see what's going on. They email me if there's a problem. And I do all of that email stuff. Now, what it actually does is it sends me six pictures, but it saves about one minute of footage up to an FTP server. So what happens is my cameras are on my network. They trigger a motion, it grabs a bunch of images, it takes the first six of those images, emails those images to me, and dumps the rest of the photos up on an FTP server. So that's kind of how my system is working. And the FTP server is not located in the office. I actually do store that on a separate, uh, on a separate server. Uh, in case somebody were trying to get in, you know, we're going to steal the server, steal the data. Nah, no, good luck, it's in a data center. Um, number two is um, while I have the capability of putting these cameras on the internet so I could actually access them, do not put your cameras on the internet. Okay, that is a really big way because these are Chinese cameras that don't necessarily have the greatest firmware. If someone gets into them, that could expose your entire network. Don't do that. Um, so if you do want to and you accept those risks, you need to go into your router and set up a port forward. So each camera is set up and you set each camera up on your own port. You use a, a UDP port or uh, something similar. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to allow any connections to that individual port through your IP address, or if you're more fancy, a domain name pointing to your home IP address to forward itself to the camera. 
um, you know, don't want to do that. Um, I did that a long time ago for my outdoor cameras because I had a friend that liked to uh, like to see what, you know, he liked to get on the web cameras around the world and things. And so I gave him access to those. I probably wouldn't do that these days. And I certainly would not do that to indoor cameras. So keep your cameras off the Internet. Um, if you need to access your cameras, if, so if you if I did want to log in, I can still log in. I can do it with a computer. And what you do is I have a VPN. So you can watch my comprehensive set uh, guide to setting up a VPN on a Raspberry Pi. So when I leave the office for a period of time, I set that VPN up. And then what I can end up doing is I can VPN in to my home network. And then with that, I can access all of my NAS files, which is pretty cool. So all of my video, all of my audio, all of my music archives, my files, all that kind of stuff is accessible to me through the VPN, but I can also access my security cameras through the VPN. So those are kind of the tips you wanna do. So to recap, pick up your IP cameras that are not connected to these big companies. Learn how to do the little odds and ends. Literally, it's usually as simple with mine. You plug them into an ethernet cable first, you go to whatever IP address your router automatically sets it. So check your DHCP table. That's going to tell you what IP address your cameras are on. Go straight to that IP address slash port number. And then you can set up. So what I do from there is I'll set up the wireless because I don't have mine hardwired into the network. So I'll set up the wireless. And then once it's on the wireless, now what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, turn it on so it's going to send me those emails and upload the photos to the FTP server. This way we have a record of everything that's going on when I'm not here that causes movement. And yes, I do get a lot of cute cat pictures as they walk in front of the cameras. Okay, so uh, with, that, um, with that, make sure that you are keeping your camera off the internet. If you have to access the camera directly, do it through a VPN. Again, how do I access it even if I had the app on the phone? So if you have the Google services, you wanna download the IP camera viewers, just set up your IP camera viewers through the VPN. It solves the problem. So those are kind of my tips for IP cameras. Just make sure that, that you're, you know, watch your network traffic in case there's anything goofy, keep them off the internet. That's the most important thing you can do. And don't get anything that's just as simple as plug it in and download our app. That means that it's going to be collecting and harvesting a whole lot of data, I almost assure you. So those are my tips for IP cameras. Let me know if you have any tips in the comments down below.